change in migration. Thank you all very much for coming to our conference on human migration and the environment, the futures, politics, and invention. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to Durham and to the Department of Geography here at Durham. Now, for the, benefit, for the benefit of those who don't know, this conference is the culminating activity of Cost Action IS 1101, which is a four-year research network examining the interrelationships between climate change and migration from the perspective of the social sciences and humanities. The action has been running now for almost four years and will wind down later this year. And this conference um, offers us an opportunity to bring together four years of thinking into a single dialogue. Now the fact that we're gathered together in such large numbers, I think, surely testifies to the growing significance that human mobility, migration, and displacement, displacement play in the contemporary politics and practices of global environmental change. I'll say more about the significance of our conference in a moment. I'd also like to take a few moments this morning to thank all of those who were involved in bringing this conference into being. And I'd like to go through with you towards the end uh, some very basic housekeeping issues. But before I get to those items, I'd like to introduce to you Professor Ray Hudson, who is not only a department colleague, but also the acting vice chancellor of Durham University. Now, Ray is one of those very rare individuals who is somehow able to maintain uh, a very prolific program of academic research while at the same time managing all the enormous pressures and time demands that come with running a world-class university. Very briefly, Ray is an economic geographer with a lifelong commitment to the economic geography and political economy of the Northeast of England, and he's also, also, he also has a few words of welcome for us. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I was thinking about when I last stood at the front of this lecture theatre. It was, it was quite a number of years ago. Right, remember when I first did, which was October 1972, which is a bit of a scary thought, but we, we, we'll pass on that. Um, a very warm welcome to all of you, um, to Durham and to the University. Um, Andrew said a little bit about my background, and I'm, I'm going to pick up one point in that in a moment. Um, it's also been our pleasure to be involved um, in this cost action, and I'm very pleased that Andrew's actually been chairing it, and it's, it, and it's great that actually this sort of final big event, drawing everything together, is being held here as well. Um, I think it's important uh, for a university like Durham to be involved in these international collaborative projects. And I know there are one or two question marks hanging over the future of Europe at the moment, um, but I don't think we should allow those to deflect us from the fact that we need to collaborate um, within and beyond Europe on important um, scientific and political questions. Um, I want to say a couple of things. Um, Sort of elaborating a little bit on one or two of Andrew's remarks. Uh, I won't say anything more about the program itself. Um, but I do want to say a little bit about the university for those of you who are here for the first time. And I do want to say something about the issue of migration um, and the carbon economy, which is actually of some significance historically in this part of the world. Um, and I think it's quite important in that sense, to sort of locate where you are um, in terms of the sorts of debates you will be having. Um, this university has grown tremendously uh, since I first came here in 1972. And one way of illustrating that is that I think when I came here, in total, there were about 3,500 students. There are now about 4,500 postgraduate students and about 16,500 students in total. So there's some significant expansion of the university itself taking place, but I, th I think what we've managed to do while growing is actually retain standards, quality. Um, there is very much a focus upon excellence, world-leading research here, excellence in education and the student experience. And I think that is something, one of the reasons why it's actually important for us 
to build international partnerships and links to be involved in projects like this, because that's one of the ways in which you bring the leading ideas and indeed the leading people in particular areas to Durham, so that not only does our research benefit from it, but actually the education of our students benefit from it. And the university is actually important in this part of the world. Um, if you know anything about the history of industrial decline and deindustrialization here, you'll realize that, that, that much of the institutional capacity has been stripped out of this region. So an institution like Durham, the university is very, very important, has a potential leadership role within the region and addressing a whole series of questions to do with economic as well as environmental well-being, not just beyond the region, but actually in terms of the impact that can have on the lives of people here. And that sort of brings me to the second thing I just wanted to say something briefly about, which is really the relationships between um, climate change, migration, and the carbon economy. It's clearly, they are delicate relationships. And so too has been Durham, that is the county's relationship with the carbon economy. Uh, Durham sits at the heart of what used to be known as the Great Northern Coal Field. Um, and it wasn't known as the Great Northern Coal Field without good reason. A very, very high proportion of UK coal output was actually produced in this part of the world. And if you look at the relationship between the coal economy and the industrial economy more generally in migration, you can see that in the 19th century in particular, there were waves of in-migration um, to provide the labour that was required in the booming mines and in the booming new industries. Uh, because prior to the development of industry, this was largely a thinly populated agricultural area. So there was, an enorm there was wave after wave of migrants uh, from Cornwall, from other parts of the UK, uh, shipped in from Ireland by the coal owners here who had colonies and estates in Ireland. And their standard, their standard reaction to a strike was to evict the, the miners and bring in another set of workers from their Irish um, estates. So you had wave on wave of people coming in. And then, of course, in the 20s and 30s of the last century, big, big depression in industries like coal. The, migra the in-migration stopped and selective out-migration started, which again had some quite important effects on uh, the area itself. Come the post-war period, post-1945, a reconstruction of the national economy, which for many years was actually a single fuel coal economy. So all of a sudden, coal is back in fashion in this part of the world. Uh, the waves of out-migration stopped. It seemed as if the industry was stabilizing for about 20 years till secular decline began, actually in the late 60s, uh, until in the 80s, of course, the Thatcherite period eliminated the coal industry from the deep mined industry from this part of the world. And once again, the problem wasn't in migration, but selective out migration of young people of talent from the region. So, yes, there's that, that delicate relationship between the carbon economy and climate change, but in this part of the world, it also had a set of different implications to do with social conditions for the people living here, the lack of employment, employability, and so on. Now, of course, long, longer term, we now realize what the environmental implications of that carbon economy were. But at the time, the issue was actually jobs, or the lack of jobs, and the ability of the coal mining industry to provide them. So, you're in a university, in a region that historically was a center of the coal mining industry. And in that sense, very, I guess, central to many of the concerns you would have around the relationships between the carbon economy, climate change, and the rule in and out of people. Studying those relationships and understanding them clearly is a complex task. And I think the consequence of that, and I think it's reflected in the people in the room, is that understanding them and formulating policy towards them requires an, a, a sophisticated approach both epistemologically and politically. Um, I think the complexity of the issues requires an interdisciplinary approach if we are to, to really grasp them in all their manifestations. 
And likewise, I think there's a recognition of a need for a variety of perspectives on these questions. I don't, I don't think anyone has, as it were, the answer to any of this. But we, there needs to be dialogue and discussion around the issues and around the problems themselves. And I think, which brings me to the next point I want to make, the keynote lecturers um, that are going to address you over the next two days, I think, certainly represent that, that sort of plurality of view. Um, my friend David Held sitting down there from Durham, um, who I'm going to listen to, as long as I don't get a phone call telling me I want to leave here urgently for the next hour. Um, Wendy Brown from Berkeley, uh, Claire Colebrook from Penn State, although I gather she's joining us um, quite electronically via Skype uh, rather than in person, and Elizabeth Ferris from the Brookings Institute and the LSE. So I think you're in for um, an exciting and, and intellectually exciting couple of days. Welcome again to Durham. Um, as I say, I hope to listen to David, and, and I hope to come back later in the day um, for at least the last of the lectures. But in the meanwhile and beyond that, um, can I give you a very, very warm welcome again to Durham and wish you a very stimulating and productive conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, I have uh, some thanks uh, to make. Uh, first of all, to our sponsors, um, obviously to Cost, uh, who's bankrolling this event. <laughs> Uh, many thanks to Durham University, in particular the Department of Geography for hosting us. Um, also at Durham, the Institute for Hazard, Risk and Resilience, and the Center uh, for Visual Arts and Culture. I'd also like to thank the Cartier Foundation, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, and the ESRC. Um, the conference is also made possible by the labor of several individuals, Julie Dobson, Stephen Allen, Emma Hibbett, Daryl Dowding, Chelsea Challens, Alan Forster, Nick Walton, Sarah Hughes, Kooch Chuhan, and his team at Metaceptive, the Virtual Migrants Collective, and Transitions Durham. To each of you, I offer my very sincere personal thanks. And finally, I'd like to just offer a quick thanks to my co-conspirators and cost action colleagues who helped me convene the conference, Francois Jemin and Dimitri Manu. Okay, um, just some thoughts about the conference itself. This conference has been a long time in the making. I first began thinking about it about four years ago, but planning for it really didn't get underway until about a year and a half ago. And from the very outset, uh, my ambition was to organize a truly interdisciplinary conference, one that would reflect the incredible range of work that researchers from around the world are undertaking on the relation between environmental change and migration. And judging by, judging from the program, I think we've achieved that. Uh, we have with us scholars from India, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Canada, and of course from all across Europe. Working on and with everything from agent-based modeling to cultural and political theory. And in this sense, I think all of us in this room have achieved something really quite unique. But this kind of interdisciplinary gathering uh, also poses a unique set of challenges in terms of translation. With the, breadth of this, with the breadth of our expertise, it's reasonable to assume that while we may find ourselves using many of the same words and terminology to describe our research, what we actually mean by those terms can differ radically from one person to the next. So here I think it's important for us to bear in mind that the promise of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary dialogue is political almost by definition. And this, for me, is for the good. But more than simply an interdisciplinary conference that would reflect existing work, Francois, Dimitra, and I were also very much interested in designing a conference that would open up the migration environment relation to a new range of academic constituents. And our reasoning here is that the sheer complexity of our shared object of study, migration and the environment, demands the widest degree of engagement from across the research community. Or to put this in slightly less guarded language, we wanted to stir the pot. We wanted to host a conference with a political spark, a conference that would foreground not simply our methodological and theoretical differences, 
but also one that would allow us to foreground our political differences, albeit, and very importantly, in a context of mutual respect and recognition. And our reasoning here is twofold. First, global environmental change and migration are each in their own right deeply political issues. Both elicit extraordinary passions and commitments and profound disagreement. My own view is that these are two of the most pressing political issues of our times, by which I mean both pose enormous challenges for how we conceive of the political. If the political has something to do with the formation of collective being, of being in common and looking after the commons, then on their own, both global environmental change and migration as discrete areas of politics and policy certainly challenge us to think about how to live, live in common in a fragile world. But what happens when we conceive of the political, when we place global environmental change and migration together? What notion of the commons do we need in order to live and move in the Anthropocene? And the very simple answer to these questions is that in spite of the very important work that many of us in this room are doing, we don't really have a clear answer. We don't really know. My deepest concern is that without a clear sense of the commons uh, in our discussions on migration and the environment, we risk paradoxically positing a common humanity in which some lives become more valued than others, or in which existing political and economic and social inequalities are intensified. Hence, conferences like this become useful starting points for discussing and disagreeing about what such a commons might entail, or indeed, if one is even required. But the second reason we sought to put together a conference with a political spark was that indifference lies the new. Responding to the complexities of global environmental change and migration requires vast amounts of creativity and innovation. And at least in my own view, at least my own view is that creativity and innovation are spurred on when opposites collide in moments of contestation. For example, if the welfare state was one of the great social political achievements of the 20th century, then we need to acknowledge that it was conceived in the crucibles of conflict and violence. Now, I'm not for a moment suggesting a return to the welfare state as it might have been known historically, nor am I advocating Violence. I am, however, suggesting that creativity and innovation required to answer the questions all of us in this room are grappling with. How to live in a world that is undergoing a fairly rapid geo and biophysical bio transformation. Who can move in such a world and under what conditions? The creativity that we need in order to answer these questions may well reside in the plurality that we represent. So let us cherish our differences. And this brings me to the three conference themes, futures, politics, and invention. <coughs> Francois, Dimitra, and I chose these themes because they map broadly onto the structure of the cost action. Now, the action itself is organized by three working groups. Working group one has been grappling with issues of method and knowledge production. Working group two was set up to address issues of law and policy. And working group three was set up to grasp with to grapple with the theoretical dimensions of climate change and migration. So taken together, we have the themes of our action, knowledge, law policy, and theory. Now the conference themes were chosen uh, because they map broadly on to these action themes. So with the theme of futures, we're trying to get at the idea that the knowledge used to conceptualize the relation between climate change and migration is by and large speculative. The futures theme reminds us that migration is often represented in the context of global environmental change, the Anthropocene, or climate change, as a future conditional phenomenon, something that will or may occur in the future. This suggests that any attempt to think and research migration in this context means having to grapple with its future conditionality. The second conference theme, politics, was chosen because it designates something about the legal, juridical, and decisionist dimensions of global environmental change. So if working group two on law and policy was set up to think through legal and policy responses to the migration effects of environmental change as a problem of government, then the politics theme of our conference acknowledges that these, respo that these responses are saturated in politics. But as we note in the conference concept note, politics are irreducible 
to governance and management. Politics are also about power, interests, and contestation. And so alongside <coughs> law and policy, the politics theme of our conference also invites us to consider what forms of power and contestation are present in our discussions on human migration and the environment. And finally, the theme of invention maps on to the theory working group. If theory is partly about analyzing the phenomenon uh, with a view to generating new and novel insights about the world, then theory is also in part an optimistic practice. The theme of invention is offered here as a term of optimism. If the relation between migration and environment is frequently conceived as one of crisis, then the concept of invention can inspire us to rethink this relation as one that requires our creativity, our cooperation, and vision. And here then, with invention, is the idea that the future is not a foregone conclusion, but is very much ours to make. So our hope is that with these themes, futures, politics, invention, uh, these themes will give us a collective vocabulary for grappling with our shared object of concern, human migration and the environment. Okay, now, that's just a little background about the conference and some provocation to get everyone thinking. Um, before we move on to hear from our first uh, keynote speaker, uh, I'd like to just offer up a few uh, very quick housekeeping uh, items, uh, and the, of which there are four. Uh, so first of all, the cost reimbursements. Um, it's for those of you who are being reimbursed by cost, it is very important, imperative in fact, that you sign the register every day. I know that you will have signed the register on your way in this morning, but you need to do so every single day. This is a requirement that cost asks of us, and without your signature, it makes it very, very difficult for us to convince cost that you are actually here, and so for us to reimburse. So please sign the register. As well, if you have your travel reimbursement forms with you, then could you, and receipts, you can hand those in to us now. But if you don't, then by all means, you can send those to me via the post. Second housekeeping issue is to do with the program. You'll notice that the timing is, is very tight. Uh, you're being pushed quite hard this week. So in order for things to run smoothly, uh, I'd like to ask everyone please to not be late for your sessions. Um, that will have a cascading effect, um, and I, which I'd like to very much avoid. So each session will be chaired by somebody my plea is for the chairs to please start your sessions on time and please don't let your sessions run over time. Um, okay, so that's the second point. The third point is um, just a map of the science of set. You wouldn't, be, you wouldn't be sitting in a geography department if, if there weren't maps, right? Um, anyway, we are uh, located in the geography building, which you see located on the left. That red line will give you the, the optimal pathway over to uh, the chemistry building, which is where our sessions will be held. That red line will take you about three and a half minutes to walk. I timed it last week, maybe four. Um, so it doesn't really leave us a whole lot of time to linger after this session and other of the plenary sessions. Um, you'll also note that the, uh, where we have lunch in the Kalman Learning Center uh, is right in the middle of that pathway. The Kalman Learning Center is the cylindrical building, which is just outside uh, the door here. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, just in regards to tonight, um, the last, the second of today's keynote talks will end at 6 p.m. At 6:30, we're screening a film called Exit. Uh, which will be followed by a panel discussion. And that will run us very likely to about 8 o'clock in the evening. And I know that many of you will be very hungry by that point. So we've, we've got some food available from 6 until 6.30. It's not a full dinner, but it is um, a, a, an ample uh, snack for people. So um, please um, just know that there is something for you to eat if you do start getting hungry uh, in a day. Right. I think that's everything that I have to say. I'd like to introduce then um, Jeanette, Dr. Jeanette Scheider, who is um, a sociologist at Bielefeld University and also the vice chair of the Cost Action and a very close colleague who will introduce our first keynote speaker. Jeanette. Thank you.
yeah, we just learned that time is a scarce resource, <laughs> so I try to keep myself short. Nevertheless, I don't want to miss the opportunity to thank Andrew, uh, because I think he is a brilliant chair for the cost action. And um, I also want to express my gratitude to the EU, um, and because, uh, well, we had in Bielefeld also a row of series on the same topic and um, I think it's really great that we can continue our discussions here. So, and um, yeah, now I have the pleasure to introduce uh, David Held, who is Professor of Politics and International Res um, uh, Relations in Dur at Durham University and also Director of the Institute of Global Policy. Um, he is also founder and director of Polity Press and uh, the general editor of the Willie Blackwell flagship journal Global Policy. And, uh, well, he published more than 60 books as author or editor, and co author and co editor, and also an extensive number of uh, academic articles. And um, he's now going to uh, talk about um, climate change, migration, and the cosmopolitan dilemma. And I guess it's the application of his uh, recent research on the topic of uh, environmentally induced migration. And um, I would say, I hope I'm right, he's talking about the paradox that the greater the need is um, for joint action on a global problem, the more difficult it is to achieve. And um, yeah, please, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, 9.30 is early for me, it's early for you. I'll try and keep this light. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how to work with PowerPoint. Oh, I've it already. Just because you're all geographers and I'm not, I produce some lovely maps for you. Well, we'll start here. The title really is Migration, Climate Change, and the Cosmopolitan Dilemma. The emphasis being on migration because I think the causal patterns and impacts of climate change on migration are quite hard to disentangle with great precision. And it's quite important to remind oneself of the changing nature of migration into which is interlaced, of course, climate change as a causal mechanism. So my talk this morning is something of an introduction to the conference as a, as a whole. When Andrew asked me to give this lecture over two years ago, I was happy to say yes because it was a lead-up of two years. Two years is a long time, and the only difficulty is that it leads something to, uh, to complacency. I've had the comfort of these two years right up until ten days ago, when I realized for the first time that the two years actually had elapsed, and Andrew was calling me uh, uh, to find out what I was going to say. So what follows is not Andrew's responsibility, of course, entirely mine. In this lecture, I want to sketch something of the history of people on the move to provide, as it were, a historical understanding of migration. And then I want to focus down on Europe and current European dilemmas, interlacing these issues with climate concerns. The dilemmas for European policy, of course, are acute, not just because of Greece, not just because of the UK, not just because of the Euro. The dilemmas that interest me are cosmopolitan dilemmas, the fact that liberal and democratic states entrench the rights and duties of their citizens while always policing their borders to ensure these privileges are not available to others. In this lies their dual role as a champion of the universal, the rights, and the particular, the exclusions, creating a tension if not contradiction at the heart of their structure and policies which constantly pushes and pulls in different directions. So let me start with some core trends on historical migration by way of context. One form of globalization is more ubiquitous than any other, and that is human migration. 
At its simplest, migration refers to the movement of people and their temporary or permanent geographical relocation. People have always been on the move, and they have moved over great distances. There are many impulses behind these movements. <laughs> Victoria's armies and empires have swept across and implanted themselves into new territories. The defeated and dispossessed have fled to defensible land and safer havens. The enslaved have been torn from the homes that, and relocated in the lands of the enslaver. Convicts and prisoners have been forcefully relocated. The unemployed and the underemployed have searched for work. The persecuted have sought asylum. And the curious and adventurous have always been traveling, drifting, and exploring. William McNeill argued that two distinctions, one geographical and one social, characterizes most forms of migration in human history. Central and peripheral migration, elite and mass migrations. Most often, elite migrations have taken the form of military-led conquests on the periphery of states and empires, followed by the settlement of border regions and marches by an aristocracy and their subalterns. This kind of settlement could be accompanied by elite migrations of missionaries, merchants, and bureaucrats, as well as the mass migrations of settling nomads and peasant agrarians moving onto a new, less populated land. Migrations to the periphery need to be distinguished from contraflows to the center, where local elites migrate to the center of political power and economic activities in cities and royal courts, while the rural poor and skilled head to the cities in search of work. McNeil's model is well suited to the greater part of human history in which center and periphery, urban and rural, provide a more accurate representation of political space than one demarcated by fixed political borders. Indeed, it can be argued that it was outward migrations that helped define and extend the outer limits of political control of a state or empire rather than the crossing of immutable political boundaries. The large-scale movements and peoples has an enormously long history, of course. Since the emergence of the first rudimentary states over 6,000 years ago, human migrations have crossed fragile boundaries as well as extended and reshaped them. Mobile nomads have crossed continents and carved out new empires. Some older polities have acquired an internal dynamism that allowed them to push outwards from the center. Religion and economics have propelled missionaries and merchants across <coughs> continents. But here I want to outline the main lines of migration history as, they've shaped, as they have been shaped by Europe and in turn shape Europe indeed to today most acutely in the Mediterranean. Most migrations, more accurately, were regional rather than global. Though Islam's African, European and South Asian outposts do indicate processes of global migration. From the late 16th century, however, a case can be made that the levels of migration significantly increased as a result of Europe's changing economic and military dynamics. The early years of European expansion were not marked by an easy or effortless dominance, but by the precariousness of Europe's technological and military edge and the minuscule level of actual migration that followed the conquests of the New World. The transatlantic uh, extent of the European invasions may have been geographically, may have geographically exceeded most earlier processes of conquest and migration, but its intensity and durability initially remained low. <coughs> However, three patterns of global migration and movement emanating from or controlled by European powers heralded an era of migration that came to exceed its historical predecessors, both in extent and intensity. bit much early in the morning. These migrations were the acceleration and completion of the European conquest and population of the Americas and Oceania, the massive pushing out towards um, uh, uh, what is now, of course, the United States and uh, Latin America, the transatlantic slave trade that fueled the economic development of the colonies, and the mass movement of Asian labor that replaced the labor flows extinguished by the termination of slaving. For most of the long 19th century, 1760 to 1914, 
economic forces were the primary movers of migratory flows. The early push of religious persecution and the pull of distant and exotic wealth in the 17th century gave way to the blunter realities of differential economic development and opportunities in the Americas for many Europeans. Even when the stray trade was halted in the 19th century, the scope and scale of European and Asian migrations continued to escalate into the 20th century. These great waves of migrations brought to an almost, were brought to an almost complete halt, of course, by the First World War. Human migration reached its, 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 its peak in the period 1880s to 1914. But by 1914, it came to a blunt halt. So the great waves of migration came to a blunt halt with the First World War. When the smoke cleared in 1918, the situation was transformed. The demand for European, Asian, and African labor in the colonies was in decline. A nationalist and exclusionary <coughs> politics was on the rise in many states, and the restricted immigration policies that flowed from this slow, slowly fur, slowed further the pace of older global migrations. Economic dislocation in Europe after First World War combined with the global economic slowdown of the 19, 1929 and 1930s ensured that the interwar period saw a radical reversal of migratory flows. So they reach, if you see the top box, the top little box, you see the massive increase in proportion of migration really in the 19th century, in the, in the, uh, reaching a peak 1880 at the top little box in 1914, and then it collapses. It collapses with 1914, it collapses in the interwar period. While the relative geographical extensity and intensity of the pre-1914 and post-1945 migrations are closely balanced, there can be no doubt that the post-Second World War era saw a slow to begin with, but then massive increase in migratory flows, although it wasn't until 1980s that the migratory flows became as extensive and intensive as they had been a hundred years before. There's now almost no state or part of the world that is not importing or exporting labor. With the collapse of European and Soviet communism, a swathe of new areas previously sealed off became caught up in migratory flows. These flows were not exclusively towards the OECD states, although heavily so, but there were also major paths of migration within Southeast Asia, the Middle East, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, among other areas. All these areas became locked into both global and regional patterns of migration, and you begin to see, of course, the pushback from the colonies back into the United Kingdom, the former colonies, and into Europe through the North African route, among others. The historical patterns of the post-war mi post migration for most European countries has been fourfold. First, there was a low starting point after the Second World War, temporarily raised by the shifting movement of many displaced peoples generated by the war itself. Second, there was an increase in growth in migration rates in the 1950s, accelerating in the 1960s and peaking somewhere near the early 1970s. The impact of oil shocks and economic performance, the falling demand for labor, and the consequently bitter politics of immigration in the early 1970s are clearly evident in the statistics of the time. Third, and after the mid-1970s, migration continues on an upward path, if slightly more slowly, driven more by family reunions than by the push and pull of global economic forces. And fourth, in the 1980s, Varying between countries, the rate of migration begins to accelerate again. <coughs> this intensified in the early 1990s as the economic booms of Western Europe, the post-1989 turbulence in Eastern and Central Europe, and the former Yugoslavia pushed levels of immigration back up. While war and conflict continue to generate refugee and asylum flows, the overwhelming uh, majority of contemporary migrations remain economically driven, leaving political borders largely untouched. 
If I'd had time, and in the draft I wrote in my hurry ten days ago in a fury, I entered, had a long section on the emergence of borders and the surveillance of borders. Of course, this great historical period, this arc of time that I've sketched, marks a shift initially from amorphous and very permeable areas on the so-called borderlines uh, uh, of political entities, empires, and states to much more clearly delineated and policed borders. What's interesting about the growing uh, uh, policing of borders is that most and many interesting pioneering forms of border control emerge in the USA in the early 19th century. It's the concentration of immigrants in oceanic ships in a few key harbors on the eastern and west coasts of the United States that brings about a greater concentration of state resources to bear on these migratory flows. And these pioneering forms of migration and immigration control are later taken up elsewhere, have influence in, in, in Europe, and I won't go on to discuss all of that. But of course, by the time we get to the post-war period, particularly uh, uh, by the 70s and 80s, you see a marked increase in states' capacity to manage migration, immigration agencies, the documentation of citizenship, uh, airport control of flows of citizens, uh, 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 checkpoints, harbors, and airports, and so on. But despite all of this, of course, borders remain permeable in a number of significant ways. I want to shift now from this overarching historical sketch to talk about the intensification of the migration crisis in the European Union, and I want to subtitle this something like Between 9-11 and Climate Change. The European Union today is at a conjuncture of significant migratory pressures. Some of these are familiar and represent past patterns. For example, you could say the 9-11 wars, as I call them, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, among others, are recognizable forms of conflict that drive the movement of people. But other patterns are new. If migration can be seen as the most ubiquitous form of globalization, climate change can be understood as one of its greatest consequences. The Anthropocene has been given enormous impetus by economic globalization, which in turn has created new, new drivers of migration. The UNFCC founded in 1994, in effect from 1994, and the IPC, formed in 1988, have been concerned about the creation of climate refugees from the outset. While refugees are typically associated with and often legally determined by conflict and human rights abuses, in this context, the phrase seeks to capture the way climate change now increasingly intersects with conventional security concerns. Since the end of the Cold War, migration has taken on a new momentum as patterns of conflict have shifted and intensified with the start of the 9-11 wars. The combination of Western military interventions, anti-terrorism policies, and increased civil conflict have led to a dramatic rise of migration as a whole and internally displaced persons, IDPs in particular, would-be refugees that have simply not crossed an international border. Refugees and IDPs are two sides of the same coin, some separated by border fences and some by seas. Increasingly, as I shall show in a minute, the European Union is attempting to control these flows through containment policies, basically seeking to prevent my people from migrating at all. Containment policies, however, exacerbate widespread civil insecurity stemming from failed interventions, civil conflicts, regional collapse, and the widespread threat to human life chances in many areas, particularly the Middle East and North Africa. These new patterns have been given an impetus by the changing nature and form of environmental degradation. Environmental crises are not new, of course. For most forms of human history, the main way in which environmental shocks occurred was via the unintentional transportation of flora, fauna, and microbes. The European colonization of the New World, which shifted diverse forms of natural life across the Atlantic, within a generation all but wiped out a substantial majority of the indigenous population 
of the Caribbean, Mexico, and other parts of Latin America. Less, much less the force of arms, much less an attack on the immune systems, the lack of the immune systems of indigenous peoples. Until the mid-20th century, most forms of environmental degradation, at least the degradation that could be perceived, were local, regional, and sometimes inter-regional in their form and shape, trans-regional. However, since the end of the Second World War, things have changed, of course. The globalization of environmental degradation has been massively accelerated by a number of factors. 70 years of extraordinary resource-intensive growth in the developed world, the industrialization of Russia, Eastern Europe, and the former Soviet states, <coughs> the breakneck industrialization of China and many other parts of Asia, and the massive rise in global population. The result is an unprecedented array of global environmental problems, including climate change, the destruction of the rainforests, loss of biodiversity, oceanic and riverine pollution. Of course, climate change itself poses the most severe existential threat. Despite 20 years of multilateral negotiations under the UN, a global deal on climate change mitigation or adaptation remains elusive, with differences between the developed countries, which have caused the problem, and developing countries, which will drive future emissions, forming the core barrier to progress. And the big light blue color in the middle is Brazil, India, China, Indonesia, among others. Where is the driving force going on? Where's the push from? Multilateral governance is gridlocked over climate, and in this context, it is not unreasonable to expect climate change to become an ever more powerful cause of migration. Climate change is wreaking havoc on the world's diverse species, biosystems, and socioeconomic fabric. Violent storms are becoming more frequent. Water access is becoming a battleground. Rising sea levels uh, uh, are significant, are beginning to be significant, uh, and may well, as predicted, displace millions. The mass movement of desperate people will become more common, and deaths from serious diseases in the world's poorest countries will rise, largely because bacteria will spread more quickly, causing greater contamination of food and water. The overwhelming body of scientific evidence, as we know, maintains that climate change constitutes a serious threat, not in the future, not only in the long term, but in the here and now. The term environmental refugee was coined in 1985 and reinforced and was reinforced in the first 1990 IPCC report, which stated that, quote, the gravest effects of climate change may be on those on, my, on human migration as millions will be displaced. From 2009 to 2014, it's estimated that approximately 27 million people per annum have been displaced as a result of natural disasters, such as flooding, mudslides, droughts, and violent storms, Although, of course, how much of that you can trace precisely to climate change, given complex causal patterns and factors, is another question. Without an effective policy on climate change, the projections for increasing disaster-effective displacement are dire. According to the UNEP, by 2060, there could be 50 million environmental refugees in Africa alone. Apolyptically, Christian Aid more recently indicated that approximately 1 billion people could be displaced by 2050 as a result of climate change migration. However, the methodology of that prediction remains open to serious reflection and discussion. Let me bring this to a focus on the Mediterranean today. Migration from North Africa to Europe is certainly not new. <coughs> for years, the Mediterranean has been a thoroughfare for migrants trying to reach the shores of Europe, particularly since the Second World War. Whilst migrants have started their journeys from many African and Middle Eastern countries, they are typically bound by a common goal to find greater economic and social opportunities 
escape persecution and flee conflict. However, there are notable difference in, differences in migrations over the last few years. First, there's been a generalized increase of would-be migrants attempting to reach Europe. Second, there's been a dramatic rise in departures that, that travel via the central Mediterranean route. In fact, the EU border agency, Frontex, estimates that between 2013 and 14, there was a 277% increase. The bottom bubble. Third, and bearing in mind UNEP's projections for environmental refugees in Africa, the push from Africa is probably, or one can reasonably say, is only likely to intensify in the future. Across the Mediterranean, migration is increasing, but nowhere more dramatically than from Libya. From part point six, look at the right hand side, one can see the apparent correlation between migration flows through the central Mediterranean and the regional instability of North Africa. In 2011, 2011 was a period of optimism and migration from Libya declined. But it has exponentially been rising since. The majority of migrants are not Libyan per se, rather the greatest number of migrants to date have originated from Syria, Eritrea, Somalia, and there are significant others also from Nigeria, Gambia, and Mali, to name just a few. It's the instability and chaos that grips Libya that has created a vacuum for armed groups, smugglers, gangsters, and human traffickers to operate at will. Hence, Libya has become the dominant point of departure for many. The current Mediterranean migration crisis, in many respects, a symptom of the failure of Western policy in a number of key respects. First, the failed intervention in Libya created the instability that led to the central Mediterranean route becoming so popular as a passage to Europe. Second, European countries scaled back recovery efforts just at a time when they were most needed. From late 2013 to December 2014, the Italian government ran a relatively effective operation called Maya Nostrum, during which time more than 100,000 migrants were rescued at sea. However, the operation was costly at 9 million euros a month, and Italy cancelled it at the end of 2014, claiming that it was unsustainable without more EU backing. And the result was completely predictable. In the face of many, in the face of renewed crises in the Mediterranean, and many, many more deaths, the EU initiated discussions of how to address the new Mediterranean migrant crisis. On the 29th of April this year, the EU Council released its summary of their 28-country talk. The agenda moving forward can be summarized in three points. Confront and prevent smugglers and human traffic, uh, traffickers from operating in the first place. There's even push for a new resolution in the United Nations that would allow the bombing of smugglers' boats at the point of origin. Triple the financial resources for the EU border operations, including the increase of ships and other necessary capacity, and enhance refugee protection. For the latter, this includes implementing a common European asylum standard to ensure the safety of all migrants, an increase in emergency aid to frontline member states, and the deployment of support teams to help process asylum claims. This could and might have gone a long way towards mitigating the escalating tragedy in the Mediterranean. However, it would clearly be a mistake to consider the matter closed, even if the EU is able to bring casualties to zero. Upon close inspection, it is clear that the EU's plan is driven primarily by exclusionary regional interests rather than a concern to manage uh, asylum-seeking refugees. These are policies, whilst having a humanitarian veneer, radically exacerbate the burdens of migrants and displaced persons from countries like Libya, Syria, Eritrea, and Somalia. 
Stefan Kessler, senior policy officer with the Jesuit Refugee Service, quite interesting one to watch, captures the underlying motive behind the EU's new approach. I quote, keep protection seekers far, far away from Europe so that their deaths don't make the headlines in European media. Moreover, a conspicuous absence from this response is the increasing concern with climate-induced displacement and migratory flows. Instead, migration continues to be seen primarily through a specific security lens, deliberately missing and excluding the larger picture. To be sure, these are difficult issues to resolve. But that does not mean they should, not, that they should be overlooked especially not by the, the self-proclaimed as the democratic and human rights champions of the European Union. Conceiving of the crisis in the Mediterranean as a security threat is, of course, one-dimensional and neglects the diverse drivers of migration today, drivers that we know will only increase in the near future. The issue of refugees and displaced peoples is one of the greatest tests of the international humanitarian ideals of the 21st century, of the cosmopolitan aspirations of Europe, shaped by ambition to project its soft power and good governance across the world. However, when cosmopolitanism meets state interests under economic pressure, the former is often cast aside. Europe, wracked by the Euro crisis, has become a sorrowful champion of humanitarian values. There's a paradox where in most European states the cosmopolitan when it comes to championing our ideals, but the very same states are often sectarian when it comes to their implementation. Let me conclude. In my attempt actually to keep this to time, I may have rushed it. <laughs> and, uh, but there you are, I'm way on time, way on schedule. In a much quoted passage, Hannah Arendt referred to statelessness as the newest mass phenomenon in contemporary history, and stateless persons as the most symptomatic group in contemporary politics. It could also be said that internally displaced persons or refugees highlight the difficulties of cosmopolitan with its aspiration for global law and transnational accountability. In the era of climate change, war and chronically uneven development, the pressures of migration <coughs> grow and could easily create an avalanche of movement. States act in a paradoxical way. On the one hand, they recognize, along with all humanitarian organizations, the nature of the migration crisis and the necessity to broaden the definition of those who need urgent assistance, not just refugees, but all those migrants forced to leave for reasons of violence or poverty. On the other hand, nearly every host country acts on increasingly narrow definitions of those who warrant assistance and perhaps resettlement. The growing crisis of migration, as Pierre Hasner, one of my favorite French political scientists, once wrote, quote, like the problem of genocide or of the environment or of nuclear proliferation, can be handled only by going beyond the monopoly of states towards a more universal perspective, such as that of human rights or a more global one, such as that of a collective interest of the planet, close quote. As Pierre Hasner recognized, the question is whether an effective synthesis of the global and the local, the universal and the particular, remains within the sphere of the possible. Stepping stones to a universal constitutional order linking the global and the local are, I have argued, huge length elsewhere, not here and I'm not won't, are already in place and set down some of the most important achievements of international law and institution building in the 20th century. These developments generate a conception of rightful authority, not as it once was in the 17th and 18th century, effective power, sovereignty is effective power, or might makes right, 
because when, when empires exploded onto the world and colonies and empires were created, the claim of indigenous peoples to have got there first was going to be a troublesome problem for claims of legitimacy of the colonizers. So the essential tenet of international law from West Fies of Westphalia onwards was that legitimacy flowed from effective power and no other claims. Sovereignty was justified if power was effective through continuous demonstration of the flag, your capacity to fly your flag. Yet the idea of sovereignty as effective power gave way in the 20th century, slowly but significantly, to a concern with sovereignty as rightful authority. That is a form of authority tied to human rights and democratic values. And in this perspective, political power is legitimate if and only if it upholds those standards. Stepping stones, yes. But it remains, of course, another big step to extend these principles and arrangements to the stateless. One of the obstacles may lie in the current conception of the range of policy choices, either citizenship or send, keep migration migrants at their, uh, uh, away. So either citizenship or send, keep migrants home. Kant, over 200 years ago, wrote about the duty to offer universal hospitality to each and all as a condition of a law-bound, open, international system. He wrote this, of course, in his famous essay um, uh, 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 on uh, perpetual peace. But perhaps today, the idea of universal hospitality can only be re-articulated if it's seen not just as offering, as, it, as Kant interpreted, the right to present oneself and be heard, or we, which we might say, the right to present oneself on, one, on the borders of another country, which today in the European Union is being interpreted as effective search and rescue operations. But maybe there are more intermediate steps between citizenship and the removal of migrants and sending them home. And it's in the search for more intermediate positions between full citizenship, perhaps, and, and, uh, and current European policies that some practical solutions might be found. Short-term working visas and limited working passes are among options to ease the crisis of statelessness while offering universal hospitality in an era of overlapping communities of faith. So, I tried in this introductory uh, talk, rather hurriedly, to, to sketch some core trends in the historical uh, formation of migratory patterns, in which military might, religious zeal, but above all economic motives, have always been overwhelming. I tried to show how these, inf these migratory patterns both affected Europe and were shaped by Europe in a most fundamental way as Europe exploded out into the world in the late 16th century in waves and waves of empire building and colonization. I've tried to focus on the particular impact of migratory flows back in Europe after 1945. I've sketched over the creation of border controls which are which emerged particularly, particularly clearly during this last 70 years. And then I sought to focus on the European Union today, squeezed, as it were, between the consequences of failed wars from 9-11 onwards and the growing impact of climate change as a driver of human migration. This shows up in complex forms in the Mediterranean today, and the European Union is caught, on the one hand, between its humanitarian ideals, which is, is, which is sui generis, as it were, with the European Union itself, uh, and on the other hand, its um, uh, 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 desire to minimize inward migration and to control the numbers arriving on the shores of Europe. Uh, I then, in my concluding remarks, went back to what I think are some rather wonderful perceptive comments from Hannah Arendt and from uh, Stephen Hasner. And I want to just finally conclude uh, 
by saying that the dilemmas of cosmopolitanism in the current era are genuinely difficult dilemmas. On the one hand, I think it's easy to argue that in the last hundred or more years, the only agent that has become free to move across the globe at will is capital. So you get an increasingly asymmetrical triangle between the state, capital, and labor. Capitalist has exit, whilst, of course, the state is rooted to territory and populations uh, find it difficult to move and having nothing like the freedom of labor. On the other hand, whilst we've recognized that, some people argue that labor should have the same rights of movement as capital, and any world in which capital just moves freely without the free movement of labor just reveals the hypocrisy and contradictions of the era in which we live, where capitalism trumps uh, other, other humanitarian uh, uh, requirements. If we're going to have a global market, the argument might be labor should be as free as capital, and you would get some new equilibrium of demand and supply. You can interpret this in a liberal way. You can interpret it in a more radical way. But of course, that leaves out, the opening up of all borders leaves out the complex patterns of representative politics today and reluctant populations often ho hostile to increasing immigration, especially in the developed world. Less so in the United States, but acutely so in <coughs> Europe. And so the politics of migration has become the cutting edge of this clash between humanitarian ideals on the one side and exclusionary politics on the other. The origins of this go right back to the foundation of democratic and liberal states, but they articulate themselves with most brutality in the way in which Europe today seeks to meet, mitigate, and restrict migratory flows. Thank you very much. much for this great overview on past and current um, uh, migration uh, trends and uh, patterns and also on the overview on EU policies uh, on the topic <coughs> and what you said about um, the, how do you say this discrepancy between the humanitarian ideal and the, um, the desire to exert control uh, it also well, it reminded me of a little detail that even within humanitarian uh, human rights law we have um, uh, jurisdictional clauses which limits uh, the responsibility to offer uh, or to take or to, to uh, respect, protect and um, uh, yeah, human rights. Um, Thank you also very much for being so strict to the time. Well, I that rushed offers it, so. <laughs> us um, more time for, uh, for, for entering into the discussion. And I suggest that I will, uh, I will summarize three questions and then uh, Professor Held will answer them. And if we still have time, we collect another three questions. Yeah. Is there a microphone or an um, Yelling. Yelling? Yep. Okay, my name is Eli Kelman from UCL here in the UK and Nupi in Norway. And thank you very much for very well setting the stage, giving us the background. I'm curious that when you focused on environmental changes, there was a bit of loaded assumption vocabulary, such as talking about the migration crisis, burden, control, and pressure. And that might feed in to the reticence to accept integration, which you insightfully critiqued at the end. No one wants to downplay the hardships which many people are going through. But I'm curious if you might wish to speak to any benefits or positive aspects of migration under environmental change for both the migrants and the hosts. Thank you. Another question up there? Yes, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, the historical dimension is truly, genuinely important. I just have uh, a question which 
in some ways follows from the previous one, and that's uh, concerning the use of Frontex numbers. Because uh, Frontex is a very particular actor with a very specific mandate to guarding the external borders of the EU. And you could argue that it uh, has a, an interest in feeding into more alarmist framings of, of what's going on here. And uh, related to that, Frontex does not address deeper fundamental questions which connect to issues of justice in this uh, new era of uh, migration. So you mentioned the EU's response. Could I maybe have uh, your comment on the issue of relocation and resettlement, redistribution of these uh, boat migrants, of mixed flows? Uh, that didn't feature in your three points, but I think that's really <coughs> maybe the next step towards a new paradigm of, of migration management. Coco? Uh, thanks very much. I'd like to echo my colleagues and thank you for your, um, for your thoughts this morning. My name is Coco Warner from the United Nations University. And my um, question, I'm actually going to ask you to comment, and it echoes a little bit, Iman, and also you, some of the emerging field-based research um, on environmental pressures of different natures and, um, and mobility decisions um, kind of have the characteristic of working with highly exposed communities in developing countries where a lot of times the basis of livelihoods are quite sensitive to environmental stressors like rainfall or things like that. And one thing that a lot of these studies seem to have in common is that when migration becomes in a way a choice of these kinds of highly exposed vulnerable households, that when, when mobility does take place, it often doesn't happen very far geographically. You could imagine it as a series of stepping stones. And from your comments, I got a sense that you were talking a lot about transboundary movements, especially those in the direction of Europe. So I'm wondering if you could just comment on, on that. What if a lot of the mobility that we're seeing today isn't quite as far as the boundaries of Europe? Yes. Shall I go? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, let's, let me, I'll take them in order. Uh, I only, um, I hope I only use the language of Berlin crisis when talking about the current Mediterranean crisis. And I was trying to uh, characterize the way the, um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, the current concentration of issues in the Mediterranean has unfolded. And it certainly is in terms of life and death, the crisis and a crisis response is the appropriate one, I think. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that I think that migration is, uh, it should be al always understood under the label of burden or, 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 or crisis. Of course, uh, my, uh, 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 inward migration to the United States, to Europe, and to many other parts of the world has brought an enormous range of benefits. Um, uh, 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 social, cultural, economic, um, just in the UK alone, uh, in, uh, generations of inward migration since 1945 has diversified the great cities, diversified London among other places, has uh, uh, produced, uh, made London the best center of cuisine and eating out in the world, uh, staffs the National Health Service without which a national health service would collapse um, and uh, uh, provides a source of flow of just both of, of skilled and of uh, uh, unskilled uh, uh, labor. Uh, there is a demographic crisis in Europe, just focusing on Europe now, uh, 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 an aging population and a declining fertility rate. And the only way Europe is, is going to sustain any kind of economic growth into the future faced with uh, uh, an aging population and a decline in fertility is through opening its doors in one way or another. And so the positive reasons for doing that, the positive precedents for that are clear, well-established sociologically, well-established in the literature and anything but um, uh, understood under the sign of uh, burden, pos huge positive contributions to host countries. Uh, Frontex data, it's the best data I could find on the Mediterranean, on the current Mediterranean issues. Uh, there may be better data, but it's certainly uh, 
showed um, uh, uh, a number of trends that I was interested in. Of course, Frontex has little at all, if anything, to deal with wider social policy questions, let alone wider issues of uh, justice and justice considerations. Um, you asked me then the very difficult question, how would I deal with relocation and redistribution? I, I, mean, I, I mean, I could say, I mean, I'm, I'm often accused as being one of the most idealistic political philosophers that there is. I take that as a compliment, I'm glad I am. We need more utopias and more idealism we need, and so on. But I could answer this by saying we should have a new international, that we need a new international uh, convention on migration, one that creates many more options for the movement of peoples and guarantees the rights of the movement of people than we have now, that this new multilateral international convention should explore ways in which that guarantees the uh, short-term uh, movement of people for X years, five years, 10 years, in and out of countries. We know which connects to the third question, indeed, that most research shows that most people don't want to move, they'd rather stay at home. I mean, Britain was very anxious when uh, Hong Kong was returned to China that there'd be a huge outward movement of peoples into the United Kingdom, but most people want to stay where they were born, stay where their family is, stay where their country is located, and so on. And indeed, most people prefer to stay in their locality, or if they move at all, to move in small amounts. I was focusing on Europe because that was the focus of the second part of my talk, was to try and show the ways in which his the historical patterns of migration were in, later shaped by Europe, and European empire building and colonization, and how that later reshaped the nature and pattern of European politics. But you're absolutely right to say, that um, uh, 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 most forms of human migration are local and regional, and that most people, I think, and the research bears that out, don't wish to travel far. If you read interviews with the migrants in the Mediterranean, they are leaving out of desperation, of course. Desperation from one recognizable source of reasons to another. Um, how well, then would I deal with the issue of relocation? Well, I could, could argue, stand here and argue for a new uh, multilateral convention on the free mobility of peoples. I could describe what I think that should mean. Uh, Danny Roderick has written about this in interesting ways. I fully subscribe to his views on this. Will it happen? Absolutely not. Not in the foreseeable future. There's a gridlock, as I've described in my most recent book, in multilateral governance on most imp uh, sensitive questions. Uh, there is no way in the next 20 to 25 years, that means in the foreseeable future, that I think there'll be a new convention of this kind agreed at the multilateral level. So how then do you deal with it? I think if you travel uh, uh, across Italy today, you see the complex impact of migration, and um, recent waves of migration into Italy. Large numbers of young men sitting around the centers of Italian cities, uh, without work and looking increasingly forlorn and depressed. Uh, Italy, as I understand it, someone might correct me, doesn't allow migrants in their first year to work, and so you have a large number of young men uh, sitting around despondently uh, 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 trying to find ways of, of uh, entertaining themselves. I think it's incredibly difficult, this issue of relocation and rehousing. I mean, I'm a cosmopolitan. I would prefer, given what we know sociologically about people's preference to stay local, to have an open border policy and to have an open border policy certainly that allows short-term working permits of five to 10 years as a, as a guaranteed minimum for migrants moving. On the other hand, no European country is going to accept that now. It's just not going to happen. The politics of migration in Europe is just too complex at this time and social democratic parties of Europe can lose elections around the issues of migration. And we see over and over again the way in which social democratic parties take up conservative positions on migration in order to protect their electoral position. I don't approve of this, I don't like it, but that is what is happening. So while I myself would prefer uh, uh, an international convention, an open European policy, uh, of, uh, of uh, short-term uh, uh, um, access to labor markets, uh, 
and much more fluid conceptions of what constitutes <coughs> migration and so on, so lying somewhere between exclusion and citizenship, as it were, it's just not going to happen in the short term. And it won't happen until my, the European population crisis becomes more acute. And at that moment, I expect Europe will liberalise. But it'll be a hard political sell. Thank you. We maybe have time for one more question. So, I have one. <laughs> Um, as I'm coming from Germany, so Germany is one of the European countries, at least in absolute numbers, yes, taking yeah. most of the refugees. And, but at the same time, uh, we are confronted with violent incidents against uh, asylum seekers. And um, so I think the problem is not only one of becoming elected uh, if you propagate some kind of more liberal migration policies, but it's also a problem of, well, a fear of uh, too much internal conflict and um, yeah, tensions. So what would you recommend for uh, a party or a government who would like to introduce more liberal migration policies to uh, address those fears of xenophobia and loss Well, the situation in Germany is both very, um, uh, Germany has led the way in opening its borders to refugees and has the highest number of refugees resettled than anywhere else in Europe. And if you look at the figures, it's quite uh, impressive in recent, in recent years. On the other hand, parts of Germany, particularly the former East Germany, has seen a vicious reaction to rising um, uh, immigration and a really unpleasant rebirth of right-wing politics, not exclusively around this issue, but in, certainly connected to it. Um, that places um, uh, po uh, politicians and political parties of all colours, as it were, in a very difficult position. I mean, we as academics, and as most of here probably liberal academics, some may even be cosmopolitan, as I am, although I don't burden you necessarily with that, uh, uh, that commitment. Um, uh, would prefer to see politicians leading much more educational campaigns and, uh, uh, which highlight uh, what is clear is that most people's views of the dangers of migration, of the threat of migration, of the way in which migrants take up the jobs of, uh, of, host, uh, of host populations as entirely false, as largely false. You know, the recent survey data which asked people to rate how, uh, on an on a index uh, how many migrants they think, the proportion of migrants in their country and the extent of the threat of these migrants to jobs overestimates, people overestimate the impact over and over again in their own countries. So you would hope that politicians in a position to influence this public debate would take and lead a major education campaigns around these issues. But that takes a lot of courage. And in the absence of, uh, of politicians doing it, I think we have to do it. Academics have to do it. After the academics have to have a more public role in this area. I think in Europe, academics, of course, are more steed than they are in the UK. Ray and I and others are used to the way in which in the public domain in the UK, academics are regarded really pretty much as figures of the ivory tower and disparaged as such. But in France and Germany, academics have much higher esteem in the public domain and I think, therefore, can contribute to public debate in a more significant way. But I think all of us who have a role and who are thinking about these issues, I think, need to step outside of our research findings and begin to say what these research findings mean for the contemporary public domain and contemporary politics. And if politicians won't do it, and, of course, they will only do, in the end, what is in their self-interest, we certainly need to do it because our self-interest is very modest and therefore we don't have as much to lose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow, so thanks. And I think we simply need another one. Yes, um, just to impress upon you the importance of time, we'd really like to get the session started at
1045, which means making our way now over to the um, chemistry building. Yeah? You should have a map in your conference bag.